um, risk management activity update. And I th I'm just concerned committee members would need some time, I think, to read that and digest it. As the resolution is only to receive the report, can I suggest we receive it? And um, with the rider, though, that um, committee members can take the document away and any questions or points they want to raise can be emailed back through Janine. Um, and if need be, they can be um, more formally answered at the next meeting. Is that going to be uh, an acceptable resolution or way forward for us? No, I, I look, when I saw how much it was, it's un unfair to ask the committee to, to do that. So, Graham, could I ask one more question on the topic, though? Just quickly? Yes. Uh, it's more general. Um, in the preamble memo, uh, we mentioned about supply chain risks, and I just wondered, because I was left feeling with what are we doing in response to that, um, I was wondering, in one of these deep dives, does that feature there? I couldn't quite pick one to where it would fit. But if it doesn't, that we talk about that again at the next meeting, perhaps, uh, about what we're doing about supply chain, like mitigation stuff in that case. Uh, through the chair, it won't it won't probably come up through these particular deep dives, but it would come up under sort of a yeah, financial. Well, I think a financial um, delivery program delivery so. risk um, in terms of our ability to be planning far enough ahead to try and mitigate um, those things. And we know that there are changes uh, in terms of infrastructure right? delivery um, of trying to acknowledge those, um, you know, time delays or lead, lead times probably for um, key, key kit that we need for mm -hmm. those asset upgrades or renewals. The supply chain aspects are, are really so dynamic at the mm. moment with the yeah, yeah, political environment that we are in at the moment um, and in several different locations around the world, it's pretty hard to better anticipate all situations. I, I, yeah, it was more about how do we deal with it and if it is case by case per project, then let's accept that. It's just I wanted to raise it because I, I was left with a question and just wanted to ask. Okay. Yeah. So Good do we have a mover now. and seconder now for the um, to receive the mis sorry risk management activity update? Jennifer, okay. would you? All thank you. All those in favour say aye. Hands carried. Thank you very much. Um, and so we move on to the annual report, accounting estimates and judgments. Janine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is, um, I guess, a starter into this process. Um, the report isn't complete in terms of all estimates and judgments. We will um, bring that back to you at your next committee. Um, but I guess this is the way that we work through those key um, values that are included in the financial statements and the assumptions that um, sit behind those. Uh, so just working very quickly through them um, in terms of infrastructure assets that we talked about, um, under the audit topic, we had a full revaluation of those done um, as at December 2022, so it will be a desktop assessment that's done this year. Um, staff have both looked at the capital goods price indices um, and had some initial discussions with ACOM who are undertaking that uh, revaluation, um, and there is nothing in there that is suggesting that um, uh, prices have changed to the extent that it would trigger a um, full revaluation, but uh, that desktop work is um, still underway. Uh, linked with that also, um, sorry, I think it's under uh, uh, the, sorry, restricted infrastructure land portfolio. So um, a, again, a desktop review of um, the land that's associated or under those assets is also being undertaken. Um, in relation to Council's operational land and buildings, so the few properties that we do um, still own, um, they have been valued as at the 30th of June. Um, overall, a reasonably neutral um, valuation change, noting land increases in land values um, offset by um, decreases in, in the valuation of buildings. 
Um, forestry assets, so um, our two forestry blocks within the Waiho Valley scheme, so Kuiti Forest and, and Ryan's block, um, these assets are subject to an annual valuation um, and we are seeing a minor, a small increase in the value um, compared to last year, really reflecting a further year's maturity in terms of those crops. Um, we note in terms of asset impairments, um, there is nothing that we are aware of at this point in time. Um, and there's no sort of disposals that are at a level that would tell us that there are um, issues in terms of our um, depreciation rates that need to be um, adjusted for um, in relation to uh, our, our assets. Um, uh, provisions for doubtful debts and employee entitlements um, to key estimates um, that are required to be done. Um, they are still in progress. Obviously, employee entitlements will be balances as at the 30th of June, um, and we'll bring those uh, back to you. Um, our interest rate derivatives, so uh, managing our interest rate risk associated with our borrowing programme. Um, we have a number of uh, fixed rate swaps, um, which provide us certainty around um, the interest costs that we pay across our current borrowing program. Again, just a very slight change, um, reduction in the value um, of those derivatives down from 1.49 to about 1.47 million um, is at the 31st of May. Um, they, a final revaluation will be confirmed is at the 30th of June. Uh, and then I think finally, um, just in relation to our investment in council controlled organisations um, and specifically in relation to regional software holdings, um, which um, owns the current um, IRIS original software, um, the RSHL board had previously um, considered the remaining life of that asset, uh, noting the Iris Next Gen project, which is now underway and which we'll hear about shortly, um, and so have um, determined the period over which that investment will be impaired, um, and we recognise that impairment loss in line with um, that uh, board position. So I think those are the those are the key elements. As I say, a bit of an interim report um, with progress to date. Um, we will bring the uh, full set of estimates and judgments back to you in your September meeting. Thank you. Any questions? No. So. This time we're receiving the report, but also endorsing the accounting estimates for inclusion in this year's annual report. So, do I have a mover and seconder? Thank you, Chris. All, thank you. All those in favor? Say aye. Against? Harry, thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> very comprehensive report. Key projects activity update. Um, Janine again. Uh, yes, I'll call on some audience participation for this. Um, Greg's, Greg's got his camera on, so he's obviously ready to go first. Mordena Koto, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Janine. Uh, yeah, good morning, uh, committee members. Um, so, here to talk about our uh, um, uh, uh, shovel ready program. Um, so this is a program update that's provided for you on page 153 of the agenda and onwards. Um, so what you can see is that the program is getting to the end um, of its duration, um, coming to a conclusion with a number of projects being concluded um, as noted on page 154 um, and several other projects that are currently in train um, coming to an end of their um, delivery. So um, we've had a, certainly had a good season um, this year in terms of our capital projects with the Churchill East pump station now uh, practically completed and commissioned. Um, we also have our asset rationalisation project out on the Hauraki Plains, which if you recall is, is a bit of a bespoke project in terms of both rationalising and improving our asset performance and enhancing the environment. So that's also uh, getting to the end of that project. Um, I do call out the foreshore stop bank project, which is an upgrade of, of our east and west foreshore stop banks around the Firth of Thames. 
uh, we have been successful in completing the eastern part of that um, project. However, due to some rain interruptions throughout the uh, season, we have had to shift the completion of that project into the next earthwork season along the western um, foreshore bank. So we'll, we are currently replanning and adjusting contracts to deliver that project in the new financial year um, in the new earthwork season. Um, of course, we have our replacement vessel, um, and that is a project that is also going well. We've completed the mooring upgrade, which is a, a great milestone for this this financial year. Um, I do call out that we have signalled some uh, delay in the schedule um, for the vessel. Um, the commentary there is calling out some delays in regards to both the delivery of the propulsion system and also the uh, fit-out um, that's required for the vessel. Uh, we are currently going through an up, a, a review um, of that particular issue, um, particularly now that we are getting to the end of the, or near the end of the vessel build to understand exactly what needs to be completed between now and, and delivery, um, and in order to get a better assessment of that issue um, and any additional planning that we need to put in place. So I'll provide that update um, to this committee um, and also through the key project reference group. Uh, the other thing I'll comment on is, is as we are getting to the end of the program, we are looking to wind the program down. Um, it's expected that there will be some program close down activities which will uh, uh, linger through to August at this stage is what we're expecting. Um, that includes closing, reviewing, um, considering lessons learned, etc. Um, there will be some project activity that continues beyond the program um, and we're currently planning to integrate some of those projects into our business as usual activity as opposed to being part of this program. But what we are focused on is closing out certainly the government contribution to those various projects so that these projects essentially become um, entirely internal. Mr Chairman, happy to leave it there and take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Any questions of Greg? Got one on, Mr Chair. Um, Churchill East, Greg, I understand there's been some issues with the um, with the screen at Churchill East. Is that a part of the original project or will that be something which will have to be addressed separately in relation uh, to going maintenance and, and um, functionality of that system? Yes, yeah, so we will address that as part of our business as usual, um, and that's around the uh, screens that are in place for that particular pump station um, and the impact that they are having on um, accumulated weed. So we are monitoring that um, as we speak um, and considering the different options that are available, um, but they'll be part of our business as usual program. If there are no more, can we move then on to the virus next gen? Dane, are you going to? Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak today. So um, I understand you've received the report. Um, I guess just to highlight a few things there, you will have seen that it's a consortium of councils involved in this. So there are currently nine councils, um, soon to be 10, working with Datacom and RSHL. Um, and that enables us to share knowledge and costs, um, which is helpful given that it's a $30 million um, program of building the product. Um, so council's contribution of that is 17.93% uh, um, or about five and a half million dollars. Um, and then we also have our project implementation at council and, and I guess costs and effort associated with that. So. Um, the project and the program are both tracking as we would expect. Um, we've got lots of people involved at various parts. So we have Brent uh, Sinclair, he's involved in the steering group. Uh, Brent Wilson and I are involved in the advisory group. Um, we also have Joe Haggett in the room today behind me on the seats, who's our uh, um, project manager, and my role is the product manager, um, or product owner, I should say. So um, through the chair, any questions or Comments? Um, questions? I have one to get us started. Can you give us some feel on page 157? You talk about there remains uh, a risk of program costs increasing. How big is the risk that you're talking about? So I think. Um, Otago are the pilot for this 
product or for this project. And so when they implement or when they go through the implementation, it starts towards the end of this year and it takes 12 months. Um, the effort associated with that implementation will become clear as they go through that. So the effort required from Datacom, the effort required from the council. Um, so there is a, a risk, I think, with um, projects generally that as you go through the implementation, you start to understand more around what's required. Um, we have associated some contingency with this project. Um, so I guess our intent is that our contingency will cover that, but um, until you understand fully. So <laughs> I still don't have a feeling for how big this risk is. You said the project is 30 million for the build. Yes. Um, what are you expecting the implementation pilot to be? So I guess for our council, oh, not for our council, but Sorry, I'll, I'll just pause for a minute. So our council costs of the um, for the project, we've asked in the LTP for six point one five million dollars spread over three years for our implementation. So those are the overall costs we're expecting for our project implementation. Um, You'll pay those yourself. Yes. So with the Otago pilot. Does WRC have an obligation that goes horribly off the rails to pay for part of that? No, we don't. Um, thank you for clarifying that question for me. So we have, um, we will provide some support and we might send some staff down there to help Otago with their implementation. We have Joe working across the project managers group, sharing our learning with them. So in terms of our risk for the pilot implementation and costs, no, not really. So really, there's not much risk associated with that. Not with the pilot implementation, no, but... The risk is around the, the build. There's a risk around the build, yes. Yeah, but you've only got 17.5% of that. That's correct, yes. yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Chris? Very just a similar, similar question. To be honest, I'd have been disappointed if we didn't have that as a risk highlighted in this report because... You and I both know that any IT project is always going to go over budget. So <laughs> I think it would have been remiss of the, the author not to have included that in there. And I think just from memory, correct me if I'm wrong, Dean, but I, I think our contingency is close to a million dollars, 800,000. So the, the contingency for our project is 1.2 million. 1.2. So, you know, it's nearly a quarter of our cost is in yeah. the contingency, which mm. I think is pretty conservative. Yes, I agree. And if I might add uh, through the chair, just to acknowledge Jo and her role as project manager, she is um, very aware of risks and issues and raises those at, at many opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Um, yeah, I've raised it before, but um, I, and we need to keep it in mind as a risk is, is the um, extra stress on staff in the implementation. Um, I have had some feedback um, around concerns of that, we we'll obviously be using senior staff, etc., in the implementation and the and the strain on that resource that it actually puts on the organisation. So hopefully, there's some some sort of mitigation or something that we can manage our way through that. So just highlighting that again. And yeah. Joe, hope you're listening. Yeah, and um, thank you for that. And part of our request through the LTP was to um, have money that would enable us to provide backfill and support for staff that were being drawn into the project. Acknowledging that it is hard to back for highly skilled staff as well. Question, um, but just to put a more specific title to it. So change management. Have we learnt from the previous project? And, our, and there's a sort of a concept of hypercare that some people use where you sort of mm -hmm. go a bit over the top, supporting people until they're on board. So again, in the budget, have we got that kind of resource available? Yes, thank you. And again, um, we consulted with Gallus, or we got Gallus Consulting to do some work with us on change. And so they met with all the different areas of our council who are going to take on significant roles in this process. We got a report from Gallus which fed back um, concerns and thoughts. And we've gone back and shared that with each of those groups. So my point is that we have heard the concerns, we have talked to the staff, we have feedback what they've said to us, and we have put in funding 
um, to alleviate that challenge and stress in terms of staff time. We're also um, seeking a change resource to help us with the communication and support through the process. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, if I, if I may. Um, I think those questions are right on the button yes. um, and comments are right on the button of, of, of the project. Um, of course, these shared projects with others are always kind of more interesting and difficult than just if you've got the control in your own organisation. Um, and I think that to try and mitigate risks that are associated with that, we've, had, we've tried to have as heavy involvement in the front end yes. of the planning and, and design and, and the features of it as, as, as possible. Um, but I think that change management is the absolute critical part of it because having a shared solution means we're going to have to compromise some things that we do. There'll be wider benefits that everybody starts doing things in the same way, start comparing apples of apples across councils. But um, I, I, you know that change management. I think that's what we continually learn, and uh, you know, I think that's a really important part of that we've got to get better at as an organisation. The helping helping staff with change. They, they get quite used to doing things in the way they've been doing it. Just to clarify, is this a complete rewrite of this software? So yes, when we think of virus, this is a it's a transformation. It's not going to look the same or be it's the not same. No, absolutely yeah. not. It's going to be. <laughs> yeah. and, and when Iris first came in, which was a consortium of six councils, it was a transformation. It was a change. Yes. Um, it's done some really good things for those six councils. Now this is how many councils? There? It's nine currently. Will be ten soon. It'll be ten, and, and and probably all but all of them in, in time to come. Um, it it is a transformative approach. Yeah. And I guess we had transformed. Thank you, Chris. And just to add, I guess, and partly in answering an earlier question more fully, we have looked at the different areas of the business. There are change impacts that might be greater on some areas of the business. And so we are thinking how we support those particular areas more than, than others who are, it's more of a smaller change. Good. There are no more questions. Thank you very much, Dean. And Tracy, can we? on to freshwater policy review. Um, good morning, everyone. So just uh, like to give an update there, what are we on? Page 151. So that included some narrative around the freshwater policy review. Um, for the benefit of our independent members, council has had a workshop yesterday, so we supplied the um, report, which was in draft, and also the leg accompanying legal opinion, which will be in open session as soon as our council agenda is published, which will likely be later on today. Um, it's just the, the timing and a few movable bits. We'd hope to get it to uh, our independent members earlier. Um, we do have a copy and we, you know, um, we can provide that as soon as the council agenda is um, out. The conundrum that we are jointly in um, is the legal requirements that we have and must comply with. Um, and an ever-changing um, field where the goalposts are getting picked up and moved all around the show on any given month. Um, last month and last week, we had our chair and chief executive and Warren as chair of Stratton Pole uh, present to the select committee on the Fast Track Approvals Bill. Um, we got 10 minutes. Uh, we now will have before council in their agenda also next week, a submission on the RMA number one bill, um, which has had a very short uh, submission period. Because of the workload on the Environment Select Committee, that's going to the Primary Production Select Committee. So in the interceding period from Council's workshop on in April, we've had two changes to legislation. And um, to use a word 
uh, just in the in the last item, they are tweaks in essence, and we're anticipating uh, a couple more tweaks to the RMA before the end of the year, with next year being um, signalled as a substantive change to the RMA and change to the NPS. However, that doesn't abrogate council from our statutory responsibilities to comply. So um, we also are very mindful that statutory responsibilities come with the funding envelope and how much of that funding envelope you expend knowing that some things are going to change. There are some things that we have a high degree of certainty from either the, the signals being sent publicly or through um, some of the officials at the ministries actually saying, hey, just FYI, don't put too much effort into this because it's likely to change. There are other things that we know will remain, have remained uh, in national direction. We've also got an act that tells us you have to do some things and we also have some settlement legislation that gives us responsibility. So there's a lot there to try and put together. Um, what the report was that we highlighted for council was three options, which is slavish adherence to the existing national framework, um, a mid-road, and then uh, a pause. And that is what council has asked us to, to look at, a pause on the project until we have certainty. So we looked at those three options. It will come as no surprise that the recommendation of staff is the mid-road option, which is uh, based, it is a risk-based option. Um, there is low to medium risk that we may get challenge um, because we're not going fast enough. But we are, and we will have a well-documented um, progress that we will make to mitigate that. Um, we had our independent lawyer, Matt Conway, from Simpson Gresson um, online yesterday, where councillors were able to ask Matt some questions of the legal advice, um, noting that the legal advice will be in uh, open session in our council agenda. It may have been more free and frank had it been and remained legally privileged. So there were some clarification matters and matters that council sought. So um, that's a bit of a snapshot. Council made no decisions yesterday. It was purely an opportunity for discussion and the, the matter and the trajectory that council will follow will be um, discussed at council next week. That is why, that's a big long explanation of <laughs> telling you why you haven't got a progress uh, update report. You will have one uh, should council uh, support either, well, Whatever, whatever option council supports next week, you will have a progress update report um, that will outline the matters for you. Thank you, Tracy. Any questions from the committee? I suppose it's really a wait and see. Um, if there are none, can I have a mover and seconder for the resolution to receive uh, the key project activity update report covering the shovel ready, the iris next gen, and the freshwater um, policy review. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Angela. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, Harry. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll now move on to project reboot. Um, Janine, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. So um, this uh, report in front of you is a post-implementation review that um, was undertaken by IQANZ, um, who had provided uh, project assurance throughout um, much of the delivery of Project Reboot. Um, I guess one of my reflections on this is, and we sort of touched on it a little bit with the Iris Next Gen um, conversation, this type of project is not about just the technology, it is around people, processes and technology. 
and we need all of those working really well together and, and in harmony to actually ensure um, a successful outcome. So um, this review was undertaken um, around March, um, noting that the final stage of um, the project was delivered in uh, September last year, and the project team um, formally stood down uh, in December. Now, I think that short runoff after the end of that final phase of the project has probably contributed to some of the findings that are, are noted within the report. Um, and from my perspective, the report is a really honest reflection of where we were at at that point in time. Um, but I think importantly, we have um, continued to put um, effort into addressing um, the concerns that have been raised across all of those elements of people, process and technology. Um, and uh, those are noted within um, the uh, res staff response to the recommendations that were made. So to call out some of the key findings, um, at the you know at the point in time that the review was undertaken, um, you know the it's been assessed as a, a, a mixed success. So we are not there in terms of all of the outcomes that were sought from um, from the project and the significant investment, um, but we have laid the foundation for. Um, those uh, benefits to be delivered um, in, in the longer term. Um, there has been frustration from staff around use of the system, and I think that's where the people and process elements come through. This has been a huge change for a number of our staff around um, previous technology that they've used for 25 years in doing their job, um, and all of a sudden you get thrown into the uncertainty of a new tool set and how do I continue to um, work effectively within that. And while my tool set has changed, so has the process that I'm familiar with um, as well. Um, and so that's acknowledged in you know, doing work um, to, to address that uh, in terms of particularly uh, getting some change management resource back um, focused in this space. Um, the report notes that the achievement of business benefits um, is delayed. Some of that has been around um, the longer duration of the project um, and also just this transitional period. Um, from my perspective, it's not that the benefits won't be delivered, it's that it will take us a little bit longer to get there acknowledging that September 2023 final go-live date. Um, and uh, the need for clarity in terms of that ongoing support model um, with the organisation. Um, at the moment, that relies on a small central team, um, the corporate solutions team, um, with subject matter experts and business owners scattered across those parts of the business that um, their functions are supported through the um, through and for. Um, we need to look at that uh, sort of spoken hub model and whether there is more central capability that's actually needed to adequately support um, and also the role of the um, Inform Managed Services team that we use in terms of that technical support. Um, so the actions that we've taken in response um, to the report, and a number of these were already in play when this report landed. Um, so we have... A, stood up with INFOR, um, a remediation plan and project um, that was intended to be a short, sharp intervention to address um, key issues around that integration, reconciliation and stabilisation of the solution, um, making sure that we're in a, um, in a strong position for the end of the financial year. Um, we have contracted in some additional, additional business analyst skill um, in the co corporate solutions um, team to look at those cross-organisational business processes, um, to document them, to be able to make that available to staff so that they can actually see how it all fits together um, and how it all how it all works and, and their part in that. Um, as noted, we've contracted in a, a change lead um, to re-engage in terms of what's the support that the organisation needs, what are the activities, boosting the communication um, and things like that. 
Um, while I was the had the privileged position of being the executive sponsor for the project, um, executive sponsorship for um, this phase of the um, Mahi has transferred to Neville Williams as Director of Customer and um, Communities, Customer Community and Services. Um, much of the work that supports this next phase is um, within that directorate. So in terms of information services, um, communications and people and capability, it's all within uh, Nev's wheelhouse. So it makes sense for him to take that leadership and coordination role. Um, and there is ongoing uh, dialogue with the Infor Managed Services team around the efficacy of that service. Um, and I guess the, the point of interaction between ourselves um, and what we're triaging and passing where is opposed to um, that team um, undertaking that work. Um, but very happy to, uh, to hand over to the committee for um, questions that they will have. I'm sure there will be a few. Thank you, Janine. Oops. Yeah, thanks, Mr Chair. A couple of questions, Janine. The first one I have is that when can we realistically expect to see um, both the financial and technical benefits of the move to the in system, um, like tangible benefits of that, and, and what can we expect to see from that as governors? And secondly, when do you expect the business analytics functionality to be operating? And and I guess that'll be reported through to you, but mm. will we get any um, observance of that functionality as well? Um, so through the chair, I think all of those things are a bit of a continuation and an evolution over time. Um, so there are continuing to be areas of um, benefit realisation um, in terms of accessibility to information um, self-service, some more efficient processes in some parts. Um, and so that's all being um, realised on an ongoing basis. What we need to do, though, is go back to our formal benefits that, in this case, were identified as part of the business case for the investment and um, check in on those and make sure that we've got a structured process to continue to do that over time. Um, in terms of the reporting, again, that's just that's continuing. That's a work stream that's working alongside um, a bunch of other project deliverables to continue to um, review, enhance um, what we can get out of the system um, and how we can use those analytics um, to drill down and you know start from the high level high level picture and and drill down from there. So. Um, I probably don't have an end point for that. It will be a continuation of more work getting better um, as we understand the information, um, which is now, you know, across many different parts of our business and how we can look at that in an integrated way rather than a, a more siloed um, perspective. Thank you. And just, just to follow up, is it planned to have a, a view um, of the original objectives, key objectives of the, um, of the implementation of INFOR and then the outcomes. Okay. That's a formal report to to somebody. Like, I'd like to see it come here or to the Finance Committee so that we're aware we had these objectives and, and this is the tangible outcomes that we were, we're getting from the system. And when could we expect, expect that? So through the Chair, I think um, there's a couple of things. This is This partly addresses that in terms of why did we ever think this was a good idea to begin with and what was the objective that we were looking for and how well are we meeting that? Um, so so this should be seen in, in that light. Um, but I think more formally reporting back to you around the benefit realisation would be appropriate. Um, and, you know, maybe at a, a, you know, every six months so you can actually see how that how that's okay. tracking. Okay, thank yeah. you. Can I just clarify, in your opening comments, you said... Um, or at least I think you said, there are no benefits that have been lost. And yet on page 170, um, IQANZ said these have been lost. Is this just because they're only looking within that 10-year window that the way you're looking at it is that the benefits will just be pushed out 
in terms of their realization. So you don't think they're lost, they're just going to be realized later. Yeah, so, so through the chair, um, what we had always done when um, we were coming to council to re-baseline the project, seek additional funding, was we had always kept the same 10-year window of time and the um, same benefits picture. Um, so we were doing a like-for-like -like comparison at all times. Um, you know, the reality of this being a, a two-year project as opposed to a, you know, four-and-a-half, five-year project um, means that if you keep that 10-year window, it looks like those benefits are lost. From my perspective, I believe they're delayed, um, and so we haven't realised them in the time that we had anticipated under the original business case. Um, but I think we they, they are still there to be had. Um, it, it will just be the timing. And so I think the reporting back every six months um, to be able to demonstrate what progress are we making um, will hopefully be able to illustrate that story. Could we get IQANZ to confirm that your interpretation is reasonable? Because I think that is a standout in the difference between what we're being told. Jennifer. Oh, thanks, yes, and I think the six monthly Updates make sense with that initial mm. item on project management from KPMG reports. It just keeps it front of mind on all project managements and this great learning opportunity that this one is. Uh, the I've got three points. One was um, there's a piece in there that says WRC have better system knowledge than the info team in order to be able to help. Do we have any leverage left to get info to step up its game to to get there to so that that pressure comes off us at some point, or is that just closed with the cluster of the project pretty much? And it's just goodwill that would, <laughs> or chance that would get us there. Um, so through the chair, I think that's the ongoing dialogue that mm. we are having with and for. Um, I, I think what, what the experience has been is obviously when you're in project mode, you have a bunch of consultants working with you who yes. will be the experts in, in their part of the solution. Whereas now we've and we've had a project team that's been deeply involved in that as well. Now we move away from that project mode into um, the inform managed services delivery mode, mm. and they haven't had that experience through the project. Now there has been some knowledge transfer happening between project team and the managed services team, um, but the success of that has been variable, I would say. Um, part of the challenge is um, obviously the integrated solution, the integration of the solution was happening with us as, you know, the first customers doing that. And so being a multi-tenant cloud solution, which we look at as a is an integrated whole of organisation solution. Mm. Um, the info delivery model, to a large extent, is still in a bunch of verticals around the individual products. Right. So that integration and seeing it as an integrated solution is still a process that they're needing to work on as well. A follow-up question to that would be, uh, I recall uh, in discussions that the idea was or the intention was, I think, within that info would um, work with other councils around the country eventually to roll out something. Is mm -hmm. that still being talked about? Is that still something that's... Uh, because obviously the more of us there would be, the more yeah. we would become part of the, the AU. Um, yes, yeah, so through the chair, there's definitely one other regional council that had started on the implementation process of the same um, product set as, as we have. Um, that got a certain way through and then has been paused. Um, and obviously there had been a lot of conversations with um, DIA and the NTU around the use of INFO to support the um, Three Waters entities. So that was going to be the um, solution of choice for for right. that. Um, that obviously on ice. Yeah. Um, as well, so that that would have been a fantastic opportunity um, for us in some areas of our solution, not necessarily all of them, um, but to have um, a deeper concentration of um, 
and for users and skills within New Zealand would have been um, would have undoubtedly had a real advantage to us. So we'll see where that where that lands. I've got two more if that's all right, but I can come back otherwise. Um, there's a quote in there, a small corporate systems team working to understand issues across the organisation, but not resource to support business areas to the level needed. I was just wondering, this might be a timing issue, but why would we not have um, addressed that through the LTP recently? Um, if, if, or what are you planning to do to get resourcing yeah. to a level? <laughs> yeah. So um, so through the chair, that's the area where so we have put another business analyst in there. Um, and I guess that's the thing that's called out um, in terms of when we have um, the system in a more stable environment of needing to really look at what that support model is between ourselves and Info. Um, I think the assumption has been um, there's only certain things that we need to look um, look after as the customer, and the rest of the responsibility sits with um, Info as, as it's a software as a service um, arrangement. Um, I think as time goes by, we understand that a little bit more and where the, um, where the sweeter spot might be around what we need to do and what we need to take on, particularly around triaging of issues and directing them into the info machine, as opposed to that sitting with um, info as being the receiver of a request or an issue and them determin determining the pathway from there. So we have been able to address that in the short term, um, and then I think we we will need to reassess that, um, you know, in another six months or so, and just see exactly where we're at. Mm -hmm. I, what we've been dealing with is the post go live hump of issues and resolution, and so understanding what a more BAU cadence looks like will will be helpful in those conversations as well. Yeah, I'm just mindful that the hump um, leads to you know, with the feeling of there being a void after the project go live, yep. uh, that morale, that that energy around the building. Um, and so when I get comments in here, like many people across Raikato Regional Council are stressed under significant workload pressure and feeling unsupported and transitioning to a new perceived more complex system. And then even statistics like 85% of people responded as adversely affected by the change. Um, and mindful that's you know very subjective stuff, but um, it's how they feel. It's it's how does I suppose it's more of a comment on how are we managing the the um, engagement. I suppose is the, the ways uh, around that, is that, or is that something perhaps better even? Yeah, so I think that's part of the change lead that has been brought on. Um, I think, and yeah. we've only. Um, unfortunately had that resource in probably for about a month now okay. so not long enough to see the impact there um, but from a you know from a finance perspective I've, I've brought additional resource in to help join up some of those conversations and that person has actually reached out to the organisation so we've got a range of mechanisms in place for people to probably just feel a bit more heard yeah I got that Thank um, and Very then my sense is like every month there's, you know, people are getting more comfortable with things. They're understanding a little bit more. Um, there are still pockets of frustration, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, they can see progress and light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it, it's the pace at which we can get through that tunnel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I look forward to the update. Yeah. Uh, I'm mindful six months is a long time away, but I look forward to that. <laughs> it's, uh, or it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I guess one one thought that just pops to mind, uh, it, it does get covered off in the um, project reference group frequently anyway, so we can always touch on it a little bit closer than the official meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, Janine, no, um, noting the change in, in project sponsor and, and moving into Neville's directorate, and, and it, as you say, it's only been a month. Have, is there any feedback you can give us on on in that directorate's capability and capacity, I guess, to, to lead this forward? I, I'm assuming it's something they weren't expecting. 
Um, so through the chair, I think so from an uh, from a systems perspective, the responsibility has sat there anyway. Um, I think the uplift in activity is probably around the change management, which we've brought extra resource in, um, and then probably in the comm space of needing to again step into that space around um, just communicating more with the organisation on what's happening. So I think that would be the um, pressure point um, where additional resource hasn't gone in at this point in time. Um, you know, all of this has been possible because of Council's decision to actually leave some of the um, savings from the project with us um, to be able to support this transition. Um, and so if, if there's more resource needed to get us there quicker, um, we still have some capacity to be able to to bring bring that in um, and and address those those pressure points. Okay. No, thank you. We've got no more questions. Oh, sorry, Chris. So sorry, Mr. Chair. I've not, I know I've had one crack already, but really, I'm just interested, Janine. The post implementation review, even though it's a reasonably small sample of people, because there's hardly any of them are over forty. Cent. Quite strongly disagree, or, or strongly disagree, or disagree with the um, the outcomes of the project. Now, and you know that invariably get people responding to these sort of surveys who've got an axe to grind. And <laughs> I'm, I'd like to hear it from the project leader's mouth. That is that a fair assessment, or do you think that's an unfair? And maybe you don't want to answer it, but um, I just. I just find that, um, yeah, there's quite a strong negative result to that. And I, um, I understand the frustration of the new system, um, but do you think that's a fair reflection of, it, of the overall view of, of the people using the system? Um, through the chair, I'd say that was an accurate reflection of the people that were surveyed at the point, at the time of the survey. And it's reflective of probably the um, organisational pulse check that we did at the end of November. Negative commentary in there around the system change. Um, but I guess I look at the, the challenge in that is around um, change leadership and change, change management and how we support people with remembering why we did this in the first place, because there are very good reasons why we did it, and a big element of that is around risk management. Um, we need to acknowledge that there are efficient, there will be efficiencies in some parts of the organisation, and just benefits in some others where things are harder or slower to work. Um, and I see that in, in, in my directorate, that there's some areas that are having to work harder. And then there is just a leadership conversation in terms of um, you know, we, we need to encourage our people to um, get on board with this because it's it's not going away. We need to commit to it um, and um, make it better. Um, but that means all of us having to put our shoulders to the, the grindstone. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, uh, through you, Chair. Um, I just agree with those sentiments. Janine and I have had quite a lot of discussion around this. Um, and I think if a survey was done today, there'll still be some who say, um, but I'm not doing things how I used to. Um, but uh, we, we are, as, as Janine says, trying to have that leadership uh, challenge of but we're doing it because there's a wider organisation benefit. Um, in some cases, the solutions are yet to be fixed for them um, and, and will be, which will make their life easier. Um, but there will be some who, um, in a residual, and I remember when Iris came in all, all those years ago, um, the change in it, uh, the old guard who've done it for 20, 30 years, were slower to change and new people. And uh, you know, people who come from outside the organisation go, well, this is wonderful, <laughs> compared with those who have mm. had to, to, to deal with the change. So if it was resurveyed today, um, I think you'd still get an element of it. Um, there are still some fixes, I think, that, uh, that have been worked on which will actually help improve it uh, for those who would uh, probably say today, it's not working for me. Um, but uh, there will be some that, uh, you know, and the wider benefit, and, and I'll, I'll just give one example, because there's, well, I'll give two. I think the wider organisational reporting we can do is something that we have not had capacity for before. 
Um, and another example is, I think, in the asset management space and, and condition assessment reporting, um, we've, we've started to see some of those benefits flow down because we've got a tool which is integrated and or will be integrated even better with other systems in the future. So, and that's the sort of thing we need to sell to the staff. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, it's just there was a red light for me being a beanie that the um, the sentence on um, integration and reconciliation issues. So I've come across this with implementations. So do we have reconciliation and integration issues with other systems? Um, this is sort of easily fixable. Yeah, so through the chair, that is the focus in terms of the um, remediation work that's currently underway. Some areas of the solution around that integration are particularly complex, um, and particularly in the accounts receivable space. Uh, so there is work happening on that um, to ensure that it's, you know, it's all hanging together as, as it is meant to, that we've got um, clear reconciliation and auditability of that, and that there's increased knowledge transfer with WRC staff around what that looks like. Um, I think some of the discovery is with new processes. Um, sometimes they can be, it can all be in the way that you hold your tongue um, and having to do things in a particular order. If people aren't clear on that order, then you can you can get things a little bit tied up. Um, and so there's been a lot of learning in that space. Um, so at the moment, there are some um, issues that we have with those reconciliations. That is the absolute focus of the work that is underway at the moment, so that they are all addressed for the end of the financial year. Yeah. Sorry, can I say one more? Yes. Um, just on the change management, it's interesting to read that the hypercare period of six weeks and hypercare is the, is the sort mm -hmm. of good thing to do um, wasn't enough. Um, so in the IRIS report we got before, we had a very confident yes on change management. <laughs> but I wonder if we can just, I'm sure you're reflecting on that with the, with the benefit of, of hindsight here. I just want to double click on you and really get that IRIS change management and process and don't, don't have the same Absolutely. issues. Absolutely. Across all council. Um, and it was just, um, I'm mindful Neville's not here and he's the one that you've named um, mm. as the suggestion for um, the one point of contact to help resolve. Uh, having been an employee that was disgruntled from a bad uh, implemented technology once, uh, I just want to call out that the pain can only be of a certain intensity for so long. And I'm wondering how you keep the, the finger on the pulse uh, that that it's not taking too long, because this can drag into years at times, and it can um, really fester with culture because it affects other um, things. So uh, it's more like, you know, if you were to survey again, it's it's asking, do you feel like we're responding fast enough and getting the right nuance in the question so that you get a feel, are you going fast enough enough? Because we're always doing this whole. Uh, we don't want to expend too much resource. <laughs> we we're worried about rates and, and cost, but you might need to go faster to not have all those things that aren't measured in cost. Um, then, yeah, so it's just a call out to measure that because that would be something I'd look for in the updates in time is uh, how are people feeling, the engagement score up against it kind of thing. One thing that might be worth considering is pulse surveys, which are quick. Yeah. Um, be done regularly, yep. relatively cheaply, but can really keep a finger on what's happening and whether you're making the sort of changes or sort of progress you're expecting to yeah, and yeah. feeding those back. Because rather than so, another yeah. employee later to fix it when it's even worse or when it's been a longer yeah. pain, bring them up front and fix it fast just to help you guide. Yeah. So, so through the chair, I do that every six weeks with my directorate in terms of a pulse check. So I I know I understand what their how they what they feel about their workload at that point in time. I understand how they feel about that, how engaged they are, and they get to provide a keep stop start comment back. So I I get you know is that's an initiative that we've been running for a long time, um, but it enables that, um, and we do it as at an organisational level every six months. Um, for me, it's that 
regular cadence of check-ins in terms of how are we trending. Um, and obviously I'm also talking to my, and, you know, only talking about my team, but, um, you know, there is more optimism coming through, I think, in terms of uh, the support mechanisms that have been put in place, the people that they know that they can go to um, and have a bit of a moan or look for a solution um, and just their comfort and familiarity with, you know, the monthly processes and what we do. Every every month is more learning that they've got under their belt. But yeah. So we do we do have those things in place. Yeah. Good to hear. Um we have a mover and seconder to receive this report. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Paul. All those in favor say aye. aye. Against Carrie. Thank you. It's a good report. It's good transparency. This is this is impressive transparency, in my view. Absolutely. Tracy. <laughs> Back again. If I can just uh, indulge the committee, I am one of the directors who love Info and all that it does. Um, it has made responding to councillors' <laughs> questions a whole lot more effective and timely than it would have previous. And I just want to give you a bit of comfort that what Janine said, probably in November last year, a month after it had been rolled out, the financials at least, there was a little bit of disgruntlement. Now that people can see the power at their fingertips and the knowledge at their fingertips, I think there's a lot more positivity. Just really understanding the skills about how we could use it better, I think, is where we need to focus. So it's a great discussion. Well, thank you. Those are very pertinent comments yeah. and much appreciated. I love it. <laughs> and it also helps that I see Lita Pom Pom to uh, Janine. So every time she finds something new out about it, as do I. Um, so now I'll go back to my chosen topic of choice uh, around fresh water. Um, so for the committee's benefit, uh, the Waikato Regional Council for its sins has been part of four councils that have been regularly reviewed by the Office of the Edit Auditor General since 2011. Uh, the rather scathing review that we got initially in 2011 was also one of the contributors why we proceeded along the plan change one um, journey back then. So we have taken each of these reviews um, as serious as the recommendations come out of them. We uh, were subsequently reviewed again by the Office of Auditor General in 2017 and 2019 to make sure that we were doing what we said we were going to do in response to the 2011 audit, which was quite substantive. And then again, last year, uh, the Office of the Auditor General sent out um, some questions, one through to five, which I have included there in paragraph eight, noting that they were just focusing on one, two, and three, and five, and just wanted written response to that. As I've stated, we gave comprehensive response, um, and the office and their staff were happy with the responses that we gave. Um, question four, which is in specific relation to uh, our relationships with Iwi and Hapu through fresh, freshwater planning processes, uh, the Office of the Auditor General uh, came, sat down and ran a series of interviews with um, staff internally and stakeholders externally. Uh, as always, we provided the list in accordance with the requirements and the office made the, the um, decision as to who they would interview. So we have the report attached. Um, I've included the general findings there under paragraph 11 and the more specific findings to Waikato Regional Council from paragraphs 13 through to 20. Um, there are no surprises there for, for me. Um, there are good things that we need to build on and there are ongoing challenges. Um, with the iwi consultation, we will never get it right, but we can always do better. Um, we, sorry, 
we will never get it 100% right for 100% of the iwi and hapu that we engage with. Um, but we can always do better. Um, I guess for me, paragraphs 21 to 23 says, okay, we've got the findings. The findings will also uh, be circulated to our iwi partners. Um, and we, we will use those going forward. But I, I did just want to give the committee the, the comfort that there are no findings in the report that were uh, unusual to us or a surprise. Any questions? Uh, thank you for the report. I'm I'm quite mindful how um, good timing like leaving this uh, with, with that freshwater conversation coming up next week. Just a lot of tie-ins there. Um, I I see that there's a recommendation in there. Council needs or it's, it's stated council needs a more strategic approach to building relationships with iwi and hapu. Do you have any comment on that? I mean. Um, there was really no further detail other than that statement that I in agree. the report. That's why I thought you might have something for And the, the conversations that I had with the report order, it was about, uh, author, it was about more than just being transactional to actually, you know, talk to iwi um, and form that relationship, not necessarily when we were after something from iwi, but just to maintain that relationship um, ongoing as opposed to, oh, we need something from you, let's re-engage, rather just make sure that there's a, a, a regularity to our touching base. And sometimes it might just be for a coffee, not necessarily to get to the bottom of an issue. Yeah, no, and I've, I've really enjoyed that when I've done that, but I have done it quite um, unprompted. Uh, I've always thought we could as councillors get a little bit more support on that. I'm very aware we can go and ask for it, but I meant more as a um, an automatic part of the the tune that we're in, the waves that we ride um, with our work. Uh, and so I'm just left thinking what to, to do. I would like something to come out of this rather than just receiving the report, although I'm comfortable just receiving it today and then working that out. Because um, there are some comments in there that, like, uh, Comment was also made about her lack of transparency about processes and decision making can create barriers. So, I mean, transparency, we're trying to be very transparent to everyone all the time. I'd like to delve into how that needs to be more transparent. Um, I'd like to delve into, uh, you know, how to be more meaningful is obviously something for us to work out. Um, and that it's not clear how iwi hapu and hapu views and aspirations are influencing decision making. Um, sometimes it says that it goes on all being embedded into freshwater management. Yeah. I think you'd have a, a bit to say around uh, we can demonstrate how it's going into that um, with specific projects and processes, but in the general sense, how those aspirations and views are influencing our decision making. I think there's something to really explore there. So, okay. kind of wondering does, does council have a bit of a workshop on getting. Uh, a bit of that strategy for ourselves. I'm not saying we should write a strategy necessarily. We write plenty of those things, but for ourselves, something to explore. Or does the cultural competency stuff that um, the staff have have been on a journey on recently just simply get extended? What are our options? What do we want to do in response? Is something I'd like to prompt so, so that there's an improvement at the next audit. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, quite happy with the way this has come out and just looking at the iwi comments and stuff like that. I think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, and that, and I do believe in, in answer to Jen's questions, uh, we are reviewing our JMAs and the structure around those. And I think things like that will fall out um, in that process. Uh, yeah, no, more than happy and happy to move. Oh, just Angela first. Um, yeah, probably just to... Um looking at this not in isolation but alongside what we've been handed out one of the earlier agenda items as well um yeah just um i guess in reading the whole agenda 
um, I did see a few themes overall um, from the organisation and um, relationships and risks and particularly um, maybe amongst elected members. Um, just wondering what um, Jen talked a little bit about um, support. Could, could you advise yeah. how we could do yeah, through, through things you, better? Through definitely. you, Mr Chair, what I was going to suggest is I think it's an issue greater than just this report and there's an awful lot of other pieces that click together to provide that kind of cogent overview of not only stakeholders, not only relationship with iwi, but how and what we do for, um, I guess, from a curiosity perspective, but also engaging with intent. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was something that I thought perhaps um, we could capture and it's something that we would probably, as an executive team, look at because this is this is only an OAG report into iwi and hapu engagement in fresh water. Uh, very aware that we've been through the te kurawai slash council mark process. I'm not aware of the document you've got, but there are a lots of movable pieces. So I think there are some themes there around better engagement, but also acknowledging, as um, Councillor Mara said, there are also some, along with a few of the brickbats, there's a couple of bouquets in here to capitalise off as well. So I think it's an issue, it's definitely an issue, it's bigger than just this report. So I think there's a, a bit of thinking to do as an exec to help the committee out. Yeah, cool, just sort of keeping the theme, but, um, and I'm outside the council, so I don't know what departments you have or how you organise yourself, but there's really interesting stuff in the risk, um, risk statements here. And it talks about Taramari and it mentions all these these joint management agreements, but then it has some interesting things about personal cultural competency. And it says it's part of the LTP and ongoing. So I've got no concept about where we're at. Okay. So, cool. I mean, if we, and we, I guess, um, we careful, keep using the word iwi, but if you're going to go and talk to people about water, you're talking to hapu, really. Yeah. And so talking to hapu, do we have people who can actually, you know, actually have their language enough to, at least uh, greet people, pronounce their names properly in the place names, and you know, have a sensible, sensible discussion. Not put people off on sort of yep. second one. Um, yeah. So, you know, is, is, what's the level? And is there a little team that's training everyone so we're going to get there? So, or? the through Mr. Chair, the entire organisation has been on a cultural journey, particularly uh, so in the last two years, and all our our people leader leaders, interested souls, and those that. Uh, require it for their job have been through you may be familiar with education perfect so it's an app where you can actually go through uh today or getting that kind of base level of competency um for and there's a leaderboard and everybody always likes to be the top of the leaderboard so it's been a bit uh incentivized we've also had some some training just um on general te ao maori concepts We've also had a number of our iwi entities come in and talk to us. But I think it is, it's definitely a maturing space, but um, having worked in other councils, this council, it's embedded in everything we do and we make good, good efforts to make sure that it is front and centre. Um, but it's one that we're always growing. As somebody who tends to spend a significant portion of time uh, connecting with iwi and hapu, they will tell you who they want to talk to and it might not necessarily be the person you send out either because they've made a connection, there's some kind of whakapapa or whanaunga connection there or they just prefer to talk to that person. So we are acutely aware of that as well. And Chris, I'm not sure if you wanted to add. Oh, no, absolutely. And I think you said it at the start that, uh, you know, best endeavours. Yeah. Um, we, we try to get it right, but it's not for us to t determine in, in, in iwi or hapu eyes what right is. Um, so it's it's awkward. Just uh, through you, Mr Chair, just wanted to give a, a little anecdote on it, I suppose. Nothing to do with the report itself, but back in 2011, when the OAG came to us and, and four councils, the promise was that 
Um, if you agree to be part of this, we'll leave you alone and we'll go around other councils. Well, actually, having done that first report, they then decided, oh, no, let's go back to the same councils every time. Um, <coughs> we don't actually carry headroom for these sort of things that come along. And I just want to acknowledge the staff that an enormous amount of work is expected from us by OAG and an enormous amount of work goes in to these reports. And it's generally by staff uh, in the organisation who are doing it on top of the other workloads. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, for the committee. Um, uh, and, uh, and and we accept the findings from their perspective, however it, however it is. Mm. Hi, if there are no further questions, can I have a mover and seconder to receive this report, please? Thanks, Warren. Thanks, Bruce. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, carried. Right, item... 16 annual leave management well-being and health and safety indicators good afternoon i'll take the report as read this afternoon and point you to a few key points as i go through uh, on the second page of the report there, you'll see in relation to the annual, annual leave balances um, up to date, we have 32 people uh, over 240 hours, 12 people over 280 and two people over 320. Um, so that's been a, a focus um, for us ongoing and you'll see that the, you know, it's not declining. So there's still work to do there. Uh, it's been discussed again at ELT and we're looking at ways that we can um, try to bring those numbers down. You'll see also then that sick leave is uh, starting to creep up and that's something that we're seeing across New Zealand um, out there. You know, it's uh, the cold and flu season, but we've got influenza and COVID. So that that is, you know, across the, the country, a bit of a, a sharp incline, I guess. And moving through, um, you'll see under legislative compliance in point 19, uh, I thought it was worth noting that obviously we had an incident back in February with a contractor that was reasonably serious. That we reported to work safe there was a great deal of um, effort within that and um, both from a staff perspective and working alongside the contractor and work safe were really happy with how that progressed and commended it and didn't um, investigate any further and as we move through um, to the employee assistance section we talked previously about this and there was a request for more granular data which we now have we've got a bit of a breakdown across the age groups and you'll see there that there's some there's some positives and some um, things that are still a challenge for us, but we've had a 20% decrease in anxiety, which is going in the right direction, but that still remains 18% higher than um, other customers of EAP. Um, but we still remain within the kind of good usage of EAP at that 10.8%, it's between the seven and 14 recommended. And I guess we've put quite a few things in place um, to help with our staff on these fronts. We've launched um, our Good Yarns program, which is really about engaging with staff and um, educating them on how they can talk to each other, raise concerns and point people in the right direction for support if they need it. Uh, that's been picked up uh, with the first couple of sessions, having 40 people attend, uh, well received, and we have more sessions coming on that. We also um, will be trialling uh, a new resilience program, and that again is about providing managers and staff with the tools um, to address these things, discuss them and get people um, pointed in the right direction. It's all about, you know, increasing awareness, building people's confidence to talk about this um, stuff and providing direction for help. So that's my overview. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Sure. Uh, and um, just for the committee to know, I requested a three year trend of the annual leave balances and um, the graph it does look quite pleasing. So um, thank you for the staff who got that for me. Um, however, the, um, yes, yeah, so, so great progress, but um, when I, I'd like to stretch us to say that that over 300 hours category is one that we consigned to history and future. And so in future, um, I'd be quite keen to see that there's always booked leave for anyone over 300. You might already have a, a trigger anyway for that but I just noticed there were quite a few on the table where there isn't any booked leave but they're quite a bit over 300 so just working your way down in that 
systematic manner as what I've seen done elsewhere in the past. Um, and my only other question was in regards to the number of young people um, accessing EAP. Um, do we have more young people working for us these days? Is that part of the trend? And, and um, how are we looking to support them? That's probably my part. Second yeah, part yeah, I guess. I mean, I can come back to you on the data for that, for the, you know, the trend over the last few years of young anecdotally people. anecdotally heard. Yeah, yeah. But you, you'll see the swing there, you know, um, last year, it was almost uh, in that 40 to 49 was a similar percentage. And now this year, it's kind of move to the younger people, but we can certainly come back to you with that. Uh, and I guess really it's those programs that we're running uh, around, you know, the good yarns and building resilience and even just the, the good management and good leadership, having one-on-ones, talking to people, you know, helping them, um, yeah. talking about our values and how we interact with people, all, all of that kind of cultural stuff as we go is really important. Do we have any um, youth or young employee type of targeted things that go on? I'm just curious. Um, not specifically, no. Okay. No, we offer all these things to all staff. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. I was just wondering. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Paul. All those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, policy review schedule update. Good afternoon again. Um, the paper is uh, for the policy review schedule update. Uh, so take the report as read. There is only one policy that has been reviewed in the period, and that is the procurement policy, uh, with one minimal change relating on bullet point number five. Um, my apologies, the printed agenda doesn't appear to have the tracked changes included on the policy. Um, the point five does refer to page 2.3 in the third bullet point. Mm -hmm down there. The mistake. What page number was that? 253. Thank you. And the third bullet point. The link on the agenda document takes you to the track changes, but for some reason it hasn't printed in the agenda. Any questions? I guess uh, it's it's more of a comment. I'm mindful that um, we're looking with the new um, what's coming in the economic development space in the future, and I'm going to keep mentioning the fact that I'd like it uh, to go in the direction of being more uh, future focused, more um, the way that the economy will be one day. Um, and what I come across when I um, go through the wellbeing economy literature is the uh, types of organisations that redistribute wealth or, or pre-distribute and so forth. So uh, just a comment under the sustainability piece or, or social procurement piece, often it, it, it's it got a well-established kind of understanding, but I wonder if we could um, explore in future about supporting, let's say, worker-owned co cooperatives and that kind of stuff. So just a signal for future, but currently as it stands, you know, there's a lot of good stuff in this policy. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So do we have a mover and seconder to receive this report, please? Bruce, thank you. Thanks, you Warren. All those in favor say aye. Contrary, Harry. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um which brings us to Treasury Risk Management Policy Update. So thank you, Mr Chair. This is um, one of the policies that's on the policy review schedule, but just given the significance of it um, and the independent review process that we undergo, uh, presented this um, separately. Um, obviously, the Treasury Risk Management Policy um, is a requirement under the Local Government Act um, and uh, well it's a legal requirement, it's not a policy that we're required to consult on, the consultation happens around our financial strategy um, and so that was embedded within our um, 
2024-34 uh, long-term plan uh, consultation process. Um, the policy has been um, updated in relation to, I guess, our uh, inv investments, excluding the investment fund um, and our borrowing program by um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, who provide our treasury advice in that space. In relation to the investment fund, um, the policy has been updated to reflect the decisions of council um, based on the advice um, from Macau, who are, of course, Council's um, strategic investment fund advisors specifically. Um, the PwC report on pages 284 to 287 sets out um, the key changes that have been reflected um, into the policy. Um, nothing of um, great significance in there, but just an opportunity to make sure that it's um, reflecting current uh, best practice. Any questions from the committee? Probably something which, which um, I overlooked initially, that the change to the new investments advisors, was that run, was that run past PwC before we made that decision or not? Uh, the appointment of Macau? Yes. Uh, no, and, and those two functions don't don't overlap in any yeah. any way, but, shape, or form. So they're quite distinct responsibilities. Okay, thanks, Janine. Yeah. And so the PwC have since run the if I hear you right, they've done the rule run the rule over it. Yeah, so they're correct. Happy. Yeah, correct. In terms of okay. the policy, so um, we take their advice, um, particularly around um, our borrowing program in yep. particular. Um, they provide advice in terms of the working capital management of our, um, you know, counterparty risk exposures and how much we should have, um, and within what terms and with what banks to manage that. Um, but they don't don't advise in any way, shape, or form around the investment fund. Thank you. Yeah, they, the the letter on page yeah. two eighty four at the very bottom from. PwC says they, at a high level, we view the policy as remaining for yeah, the appropriate yes. council. I think this committee can rely, place reliance on that. PwC are an appropriately qualified organisation to do this, and I certainly wouldn't uh, profess it, to be an expert. And, and provide advice to uh, most councils, yes. I would think, in the country. And on the these. Yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so do I have a mover and seconder for to receive this report? Oh. Do you have a, do you review the SIPO for the investment fund from time to time? Yes. Yeah. So we've been doing that um, effectively in parallel with our long-term plan process. So um, a number of conversations and workshops with our strategic investment advisors over the um, growth and income allocation, the distribution from the fund, um, and more recently around the actual strategic asset allocation. So um, those have been working sort of off to the side under that LTP banner to now be folded into this policy. And so is that sort of consulted on as part of the LTP? Yes, yeah. No more questions. Can I have a mover and seconder to receive this report and to endorse the new policy? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jennifer. All those in favour say aye. Against, carried. Thank you very much. Which brings us to the resolution to exclude the public. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Jennifer. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, carried. Can you just tell us when we're ready to go?